Hello, everyone. So today I'm going to talk about uh, I3C. Uh, first, a few words about me. So I'm working at Bootlit, which some of you knew as uh, Frederick Trans. Um, we had to change our name because of legal issues, but we're really the same team of engineers working in the same company. Nothing has changed except the name. So a few things about me in, in the community. I'm the maintainer of the, EM, of the MTD subsystem, and I worked a lot on ARM SSE support, so developing drivers or the supporting platforms and so on. Um, yeah, what we are really interested in here is uh, that I submitted an RFC for the I3C subsystem. So let's see what this is exactly. So for those who knew, who knew uh, I2C, I2C means uh, inter-integrated circuit. Um, actually, the new I, which is what we're looking after, means improved. So if it's improved, it's obviously better. Um, yeah. I think I'm done. <laughs> no? Okay. You don't seem you don't seem to be convinced. Um, luckily I had a few backup slides. So let's have a look at what I3C is exactly. So I square C and SPI have been there for quite a long time. It's been created, invented in the eighties. And they work fine. I mean, we are using them all every day. Um, but still, they are a bit limited. So let's have a look at what they provide. So they both are relatively simple to implement. They both uh, require a limited amount of pins to uh, connect a few devices. But I2C is really slow. Um, SPI is not that slow. Actually, you can have um, devices which support, uh, I don't remember, but it's around 50 megahertz uh, clocks. But the uh, downside of SPI is that for each new device you want to connect on the bus, you have to uh, add a new chip select pin. So it's not that cheap in terms of uh, the number of pins you need to uh, connect devices on, on spy bus. Um, both need extra pins to signal interrupts. Um, they don't support outplug. They don't support uh, automatic discovery of devices on the bus. So um, on I2C, you can at least know if there is something on the bus. But you can't define what's uh, available at its address. And on I2C bus, you have the address collision problem. So if you have two devices, two different devices you want to connect on the same bus, you have to make sure that they have different addresses. Otherwise, there is a collision and the, uh, the transaction won't work. So what if we could overcome this limitation with a new protocol? And this is what I3C is here for. So I couldn't decide it. Uh, MIP, the fact that the I3C standards is pushed and developed by MIP was a good thing or the bad thing, so I left it here. Um, I let you decide. <laughs> um, but the good things about the protocol is that it addresses most of the problems we had with uh, I2C and SPI. First thing, you still need only two pins, like I2C. But now the protocol supports what they call in band interrupts, which means if you want to signal interrupts, you don't, need to, you don't need to add an extra pin per device to do that. It's already, everything goes through the bus directly. It provides higher throughput. Um, it's still not what you would achieve with a spy bus, but obviously better than what you have with a square C. Um, it's better uh, in terms of power management than uh, I2C. Oh, that's not that easy to determine, but it's the, the calculation based, uh, the calculation done by the MIP, MIP Alliance was based on a per bit basis. 
So it might happen that uh, if you have a nice QRC device connected on a nice QRC bus, it will probably consume less than uh, if it was connected to a nice, a, a nice 3C bus. But still, it's a good thing. Um, it supports outplug natively. You can discover devices on the bus, which is much easier to support than having to declare all devices st statically in your firmware. Uh, it supports dynamic address and assignment, which means the devices no longer have their address assigned statically. Um, one important thing, in my opinion, is that you have backward compatibility with uh, I2C, which means on the I3C bus, you can connect your old I2C devices. Or most of them, we'll see a bit later, that is not always the case. And I'm not sure about the last one, but I guess this is what they plan to do uh, in the I3C group. I think they the, the plan to standardize the device profiles pretty much like what you have with USB classes. So you say that you have such kind of device and then there is a command interface to control this device and you don't have to implement a driver for each new device uh, created by, by a new vendor. So the downside with I3C is that it will likely be harder to implement in your hardware than I2C was or SPI was. So let's have a look at the protocol in, in more details. Um, the first thing you have to keep in mind is that I3C has been developed with backward compatibility in mind. Um, why? Simply because all the I2C devices won't go away. And we want to be able to support them. And to support them, we have two solutions. Either we have two buses, one for the I2C devices, one for the I3C devices, or we make sure that I3C buses are backward compatible with I2C devices. And that, that's what they decided to do, simply because you, want to, uh, you don't want to add two more pins to exposed devices. Um, but backward compatibility goes the other way around too. Uh, I mean, if you are, a, uh, nice 3C device vendor. You want your device to work indifferently on an I2C bus on, or an I3C bus. And that's why you will like the uh, backward compatibility with I2C. So that's also supported in, in the protocol. So let's have a look at the physical layer now. As I said, it's really similar to uh, the I2C protocol, and we have two lines, the clock line, the data line. Uh, the data line is most of the time in open drain mode with a pull up. You have the same uh, start, repeat start, stop, act, knack sequence. So these kind of things didn't change. Still, we have a few, sh few things that have changed. And one of them is that we no longer use we no longer uh, drive the clock in open drain. So let's see why. If you have an upper, um, a clock running at, say, 400 kilohertz, and you have a line driven with open drain with a pull-up, you'll have a signal which looks like that, like that, and the same signal driven in push-pull. So you see that the open drain one takes a bit more time to rise, and to go over the logical high level. So that's fine, because the clock period is large enough to be able to detect when the level goes high and when it goes low. But then take the same signal and put it at uh, 12 megahertz. And you'll see that with the open drain, with a pull-up approach, your signal will actually never uh, rise fast enough to uh, go over the high level logical eye level. And that's a problem, because we want to be able to transmit things faster on the bus. So we have to move to push-pull in order to increase the uh, clock frequency. But when doing that, 
we break a bit of the backward compatibility. For example, devices which are doing clock stretching, so clock stretching is about retaining the clock law so that the master can send the next bit of data because the slave is uh, too slow to handle more data, then that's no longer supported with uh, I3C. Um, yeah. Also, SDA is still most of the time in open, in open drain, except when you want to do um, high speed transfers. And in this case, for the very much reason, you have to switch and push pull because you want your signal to raise, to rise fast enough to, to be able to detect the change. Um, and then the last thing that changed is that they added new modes of transmission, so you, what they call high data rate modes. And then you have several sub modes. So you can use either DDR, which means you are transmitting things on both clocks, on both ex edges of the clock, or you can have a ternary ba based mode where you encode things using the two signals. So each transition is, in is encoded using SDA and SCL, not only SDA. So I said that we want to use push-pull to be able to achieve higher uh, throughput. But that's not simple. I mean, I2C has been designed to use open drain with up-rub. And there are several reasons for that. The first one is that it's simpler to implement. And the second one is that it helps when several devices on the bus have to take control of the bus. If you use a an open drain with pull up approach, that means that the default state is high level, and when someone wants to drive the line low, then it, it drives the line low. But if two devices, there, there, there is never two devices which drive, one device is drive the line low, and the other one, the, the other one drive the line high, which would then be a problem. Um, so we still have to support those devices which want to, um, to use open drain sometime. So for uh, the clock line, that means that, of course, we can do uh, clock stretching and also we can't have a multimaster. So that means that, yeah, pretty much that's it. Um, for the SDA line, there are some phases where um, you'll want the slave device to control the data line, which means in this case, you have to switch from push pull to open drain. And actually, the I3C master controller is doing that dynamically. So depending on where it is in the state machine, it will decide to drive the line in push pull or switch to open drain to let the slave device control the line. And that's how you can make sure uh, I2C devices still work fine on I3C buses. Um, so what about performances? Um, when you run the clock at 12 megahertz, you are, about, you are at about 1.4 megabyte per second, but then you have another problem. I mean, I2C devices have not been developed to support such high-speed clock. They usually run, or some of them might support that, but at least it, it's not always the case. So we have to make sure that um, devices on the, uh, accuracy devices on the, the bus still work correctly. The first solution is to slow down everything, so slow the clock down, or we can find a solution to make the high square C devices think that the clock signal stays low. And that's what the um, I3C, I3C protocol is doing. So instead of having a symmetric clock signal where the low period is equal to the high period, you have a, a clock signal which is asymmetric with the um, high period which is below 15 nanoseconds, and the high period, which the low period, which can be extended. 
And because some devices embed spike filters, so they detect that the signal was not maintained more than 50 nanoseconds, then what they see on the bus is just a low level and nothing more. And thanks to that, you can achieve better performance than if you drive the whole clock signal at a low rate. So of course, you're not, you're not achieving uh, the, the full performance because you're not running the clock at 12.5 megahertz, but it's still better than uh, slowing the whole bus at the slowest uh, device rate. So let's sum up. An I3C bus can be in three different configuration. You can have the pure bus configuration, which in which case you only have I3C devices connected on it. The clock signal runs at 12.5 megahertz. You can support all I, um, I data rate modes. And of course, this is what you'll want to use. But sometimes you have to put I2C devices on the bus. And in this case, you have two sub cases. The fast bus uh, mode, mixed fast bus mode, which means all the devices, all the i 4 devices on the bus contains a um, spike filter, and then you can use the trick we've just seen. Or some of the devices on the bus do, don't contain the uh, spike filter, and in this case, you have to run the clock at the uh, lowest rate supported by the i 2 c devices. So obviously, the last case is you don't want to end up in this case, because in this case, I3C is pretty much useless. So let's switch to addressing scheme. We've seen the physical layer. Now, how can we address devices in I3C? Well, it's, all, it's also pretty similar to uh, I2C. You have seven-bit addresses. Uh, devices are expected to hack or knack the transaction, and still there are a few differences. The first one is that devices are no longer statically assigned their addresses. So the master decides which address will be assigned to the device. And then that means you don't have any collision. That's, that's a good thing. The second thing is that there is a broadcast, broadcast address. And with this broadcast address, we will, we will be able to address all the devices on the bus at the same time. So that's also a new thing. And of course, this address has been picked in the reserve range of the I2C protocol so that you're sure that no I2C device should have this exact address. So let's sum up uh, what we've found about I2C backward compatibility. Obviously, the Phi and Mac layer have been designed to be backward compatible with I2C, but still, that's not enough. For example, you won't be able to, co to connect slaves which are doing clock stretching because that's completely forbidden in I3C. If you have I2C devices, you might be able to connect them to the bus, but remember that if, you, if they don't have spike filters, then the performance will be really low. And obviously, you don't, you don't want that. And also, you have to remember that some of the high data rate modes are not usable when some devices, some high quality devices are present on the bus. So it's backward compatible, with the, compatible, but still has some drawbacks. Um, so we've seen the addressing and physical layer. Now let's see um, the uh, functional differences between uh, I3C and I2C, which is what most developers, software developers, are interested in. So while the I2C and I3C physical and addressing layer were pretty similar, from a functional point of view, I2C and I3C are really different. For example, as I said several times, Addresses are not statically assigned, but now they are dynamically assigned by the, the, the master. Um, but one of the most interesting points here is that all devices on the bus can be discovered. 
and you will no longer have to describe them statically in your device tree or, or uh, in your both file or, or, or whatever. Also, devices are self-descriptive. That means that when you discover something on the bus, you will know exactly which device this is, and uh, you will be able to easily attach the device to a specific driver in Linux. Um, some masters and slaves can support Outplug, so that's not mandatory, but I guess most of them will support that. And of course, uh, because of the functional differences, that means that this management is likely to be more um, complicated than with I2C. So we'll see a bit later how to, to control the bus, how to assign addresses, but of course it's, it's a bit more complicated in the, than what you have with I2C. And the last thing is that you have different uh, transactions types. So the first type of transaction we'll look at is the uh, CCC transaction, which is uh, meaning common, common codes. So these are all the uh, standard commands we will use to manage the bus. So thanks to that, you will be able to discover all devices on the bus. You will be able to uh, query information about the device, each device, and you will be able to keep the bus in a consistent state. And they also plan to use those uh, generic commands to do generic operation. That means operations which are not tied to a specific kind of device. Let's have a look at what this kind of frame looks like. You will have an 8-bit opcode. The most significant bit in this opcode will encode the, uh, whether this is a broadcast or a unicast command. And the seven bits will um, encode the actual action that will uh, be sent to the device. You can have a payload attached to a command uh, CCC. So the payload, in case this is the unicast command, the first byte of the payload will contain the device address. And then after that, you have uh, real data that are passed to the command. So just a few examples of commands that you will be able to uh, send. Uh, the first one is uh, start DAA. So DAA is for, uh, stands for uh, Dynamic Address Assignment, and this is basically the uh, auto-discovery procedure. You have uh, enter activity state X, so X is just a number, and this is about uh, an managing power management, so asking a device to enter a low power state, for example. Then you have all uh, commands which are used to retrieve information about the device, so get PID, uh, get VCR, get DCR. So PID is the unique ident identifier of the device. A bus characteristic is about uh, what the device supports in terms of transfer types and at which speed. And then the device characteristic is about um, classifying the devices. So let's have a look at one of these commands, which is, in my opinion, the most important one. And this is the one you will uh, use when you initialize the bus to discover everything that is connecting other the bus. So this command is called uh, NDAA for enter. DAA, which stands for Dynamic Address Assignment. And to do that, the master will uh, actually send the command and then emit, emit directly after that repeated start. And then after, after each repeated start, all devices, all I, I3C devices on the bus will emit the, their PID, VCR, and, and DCR uh, information. While they do that, while all slaves do that, they have to monitor the state of the SDA line. And every time the state of the SDA line is not what they uh, intend to emit, that means they lost the uh, arbitration. And that means they have to stop emitting things on the bus. And the last device that is remaining emitting something on the bus, that means it wins the uh, arbitration and the master will then assign it an address. So if we just look at a standard 
NDAA procedure. The master starts emitting NDAA, which forces all devices on the bus to enter a specific state. Then it emits a repeated start. We have two devices on this bus. Uh, they both emit their uh, PID, DCR, and VCR at the same time, except that only slave one wins arbitrations. Then slave two are, has, to be, has to stay silent until the next repeated start. The I3C master assigns an address to slave one, which is now able to communicate on the bus, and then emit a new re repeated start. Then same thing with slave two, which now is able to uh, receive a new address. And you end up with a repeated start, which is followed by no one hacking the transaction, which means the uh, discovery procedure is done and the bus is uh, operational. So that's it. So let's have a look at those information which are transmitted during DAA. The PID is what we will use when trying to uh, determine which driver which will be connected to the uh, device. So in the PID, you will find the manufacturer ID, the part ID, uh, an instance ID in case you want to put several devices of the same type on the same bus. So usually this instance ID is controlled with external switches or directly uh, using the pins of the, of the device. And you have extra information, which I actually don't know what they're used for, but this is something that vendors can put specific data in to differentiate the, the devices. You also have BCR, which uh, is encoding what the, the device is capable of. So is the, device is, is the device capable of sending interrupts? Is the device capable of supporting high data rate modes? What is the maximum uh, transfer speed? And, and so on. And the last thing is, that is the DCR, which is encoding the device type. So IDs here are, are supposed to be standardized by the MIPI Alliance, and they are. Um, but yet, I don't see what they are meaningful for, because there is still no uh, common interface for each type, which means you know what kind of device this is, but you don't know how to interact with it. You don't know how to uh, query information, and so on. So right now, it's just informational, and you can't use that to, to implement a generic driver which is able to handle all kind of devices of this type. Um, another kind of transaction is SDR transfers or private transfers. So uh, they are meant to replace I2C transfers, except that this time they are using the full speed mode so clock running at hopefully 12, 12 megahertz. Um, and there is no standard to uh, say which kind of information are sent to the device. So it's completely free, and devices are uh, able to implement what they want and, and all they like. So it's basically what we see with I2C already. Then we have HDR transfers, which uh, are used to uh, achieve even higher data rates. So we have three different modes. The DDR mode is obviously one where you will transmit data on both edges of the clock. And then you have the ternary mode, which are used to encode data using the, two, uh, the clock and the data signals. So it's a bit complicated to see how you can encode data with both SCL and SDA, but that, that works. And you have two of them, actually, because depending on whether they are high quality devices or on the bus or not, you may have to ensure that the, low, the high period is lower than uh, 50 nanoseconds because of the spike filtering and, and all the stuff we've seen before. Um, the data you transmit using HDR transfers are a bit more standardized than the SDR, tra SDR transfers. So you have to first emit a 16-bit word which contains a command code, 
And then again, uh, there is a range reserve for generic command cards. So hopefully we'll s we should see soon some generic commands, uh, which will be used by the uh, I3C specification, and some vendor-specific commands, which will be useful for uh, vendor-specific drivers. Last thing we want to talk about here is uh, embedded trips. So how to uh, avoid having to add a new, p a new signal to signal interrupts. Um, so how does that work? Um, basically, all devices on the bus, all I3C devices on the bus are able to uh, take control of the bus temporarily to just send the IBI. And the master, which is in control of the bus, will uh, either hack or knack the ABI. But once he, ha he has knacked the ABI, the ABI, it will have to uh, uh, retrieve the payload. And to determine which device wins when an ABI is gener generated, there is the address arbitration, which means the lower the, lower the uh, device address, the higher the priority. So that means you have to carefully choose the dynamic address assigned to each device because this encodes the priority of the uh, interim generation on the bus. Odd join. Um, it's basically what we call odd plug for other protocols. And it's pretty much the same as IBI. When a device is connected on the bus and it, will, it, has, it still has no dynamic address, it's able to send an interrupt saying that it wants to join the bus and then the master will be able to hack or knack this request. And if the master hacks the request, then he has to assign a dynamic, dynamic address. And as we've seen before, assigning a dynamic address is about entering the AA. So, yeah, that's how a join works. And the last thing we'll see here is multi-master uh, capabilities. So I3C is supporting multi-master natively. That means that you'll be able to have several masters on the same bus. And unlike uh, what we had with I2C, where all masters were able to take control of the bus at the same time, here it's a negotiation between the masters to know, to know which one of them is controlling the bus. So you have two types of I3C masters. The main master, which is responsible for initializing the, the bus, and the secondary master, which is um, acting as slave at first, and then when it needs to emit a frame on the bus, then it will have to negotiate with the current master to gain ownership of, of the bus. Um, so that's a bit more complicated than what we had with uh, IX square C. Um, of course, bus on F ship can be requested by an inactive master which wants to take control of the bus, or it can also be uh, requested by the active master when he wants to go sleep, for example, and he wants someone else to handle the bus. That's, that's a two-way thing. So these are just introductions. These are just a piece of inf information about I3C. And obviously, I omitted a lot of things. So if you want to know more, you can go check the I3C specification, which is for once open. So that's not usual for me P stuff, but that's a good thing, actually. Um, and yeah. You can go check it. So let's see how we plan to support that in Linux. So that's basically uh, what has been proposed in, in the RFC, RFC. So if you go back a bit, you remember that uh, I3C is a bit um, tricky to categorize because it's backward compatible with I2C device. Still, it's a lot different functionally from uh, handling I I3C devices is a lot different from handling I2C devices. 
So we have to keep the existing I2S ecosystem working without changing anything. But we want to add support for new uh, I2C functionalities. And to do that, we had two options. The first one is uh, extending the I2C framework to add I2C features. The second one is to uh, add a new framework and then connect it to the I2C framework. So we went for uh, option two. Um, and that's basically what we have. So on the bottom of the diagram, you see the hardware stuff. And you see two buses, one I3C bus, one I2C bus. Those buses are exposed to Linux through their uh, controller, which are then connected to uh, the I2C or I3C framework. And if, we, if you go look at the devices which are connected on both booths, you'll see that they are um, then connected to their appropriate driver. So if you go look at the uh, yellow device, the I3C device in yellow, you'll see that it's directly connected to the driver that was registered to the I3C framework. You can also have I2C devices connected to the I3C bus. So the, this is the purple one. And in this case, it will be connected to the I2C framework going through the uh, I3C framework. So we are basically using the same infrastructure, which means if you add an I2C driver, it will work the same way it used to work, even if the device is connected on an I3C bus. That's, that's supported. Now we have more complicated case, cases. For example, we said that some devices are compatible with both I2C and I3C. And in this case, you want the device to be discovered when it's connected on an I2C bus, and you want it to be discovered when it's connected on an I3C bus. And you want the same device to be connected to the, the, those, the both, device, both devices to be connected to the same driver. So you had to add a, a way to register a single driver to both framework. And that's what we did. We have a new macro which is able to um, register a device, a, a driver in both subsystems so that you have a single driver which is able to handle the device which is operating in I2C mode and the same device which is operating in I3C mode. So a few more words about the design choices. Um, first thing is that we separated the API for uh, device driver and master controller drivers. So that's mainly to ease um, implementation of both kind of drivers. So people don't have to guess, oh, is this an API for the controller part or is this an API for device driver part? Everything is separated in, in two places, in two different places, so that's, that's good. Um, one other important thing is that even though we have a single bus, which is the I3C bus, when you look in CCFS, you'll see two buses represented, the I2C one and the I3C one. And this is mainly because we didn't want to break the I2C uh, ecosystem. So we have to keep everything working as, as before. But still, those buses are the same thing, and they are usually connected through the parenting of, of uh, so the, 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 the bus is declared uh, by a specific controller, and when you look at the controller, you will be able to connect the I2C bus to the I3C bus. Um, and then, how do we bind devices to specific drivers? Um, we are basically using the uh, DCR and PID values. So PID is encoding the manufacturer and, and, and part ID, and DCR is encoding the class of the device. So we use that to connect a specific device to a driver. And the last thing that is, to, uh, that is important to note is that IBIs are not exposed as regular IAQs simply because m most of the time they do not uh, look like regular IAQs. You have payloads which are added to the interrupt, 
and you also want to send messages on the bus after that, and we'll see that it's not really possible in an atomic context. So we decided to just simplify things and, and treat them, them as not really high IQs. So let's have a look at the uh, device driver a API first. Um, it's exposed in uh, Linux i3cdevice.h, and you'll be able to uh, declare a driver, um, register it, you'll be able to send uh, SDR, HDR transfers, and you'll be able, you'll, you'll not be able, you're not able to, to send CC commands yet, because as I said, it's mainly here to manage the bus, and I don't think it's needed for device drivers, but if it, appear, it appears to be needed at some point, then we will probably change the, that. And you will, of course, be able to register IBI handlers and activate, deactivate the IBIs. The IBIs. So let's have a look at the uh, device driver uh, declaration. That's pretty much the same thing you have for any kind of driver. You have a prop function, a remove function, uh, a table of device ID, which are used to bind devices to drivers, and that's all. Then you call, you declare your driver structure, and you call module i3c driver, and it registers the driver to the i3c framework. So nothing new here. The same thing goes for the SDR transfers. So it's pretty simple. Um, it looks like the things you've, you've been using with i3c. So you declare a table of transfers, whether these are reads or write, and then you send the transfers to the device. And pretty much the same for HDR transfers, except that now you'll have to specify a specific uh, opcode and the mod you want to send, uh, the, one, the mod you want to use to send this transfer. So nothing really complicated. IBI is a bit more complicated. Um, so you'll have to first declare an IBI handler. And this IBI handler is called from a non-atomic context. So you can uh, send a new message in this IBI handler. And when you request an IBI, an IBI you will have to um, specify the max payload size. So normally, this is defined in the uh, data sheet of the device. And then you have to define the maximum number of slots allocated to this IBI. And this is mainly useful because since you, you're not only that in, in, in atomic context, in the interrupt context, that means that you may have several IBIs queued uh, in the device before the device, uh, before the work queue actually call the IBI handler. So if you're not using, uh, if you're not reserving enough slots, you might lose some IBIs. So maybe that's not such a good idea to do that, but that's what we, come, we came up with to, to address the problem. And then, once you have requested the IBIs, that means all resources needed for this IBI have been allocated. You can uh, enable the IBI, and in your remove handler, you can disable the IBI and free uh, the IBI resources. Now, the um, master controller API. So, it's the interface which you're supposed to implement when you want to uh, support, uh, to declare a new master is not that big, and it leaves a lot of freedom to the controller driver. And I did that because actually, the, I only worked on, on one of them, and I'm not sure exactly where, um, which parts are really common to everyone and which parts are specific to the one I worked on. So instead of uh, adding a lot of logic in the, in the core right now, I decided to put a lot of logic in, in the controller driver. So basically, what the, the controller drivers will have to do is initialize the bus. And initializing the bus is 
quite big. Um, so it will have to declare all the devices which are statically defined. That means all I2C devices. You also have some I2C devices which can be statically defined. So again, you will have to uh, declare them in the controller. And then once this is done, you will uh, start a DAA to discover all the devices on the bus. And you will then declare all the devices you've discovered on the bus to the uh, framework. So that's basically what you'll have to do when initializing the, the bus. Then you will also have to provide some methods to uh, send all kind of transfers. So you have one for pri private transfers, HDR commons, uh, and CCC commons, and also one for I2C co uh, transfers. Um, for CCC common, you can you have a support CCC common hook, which is used. Uh, to check that the CC common is supported because not all CC commands are mandatory. So your controller may support or, or not a specific common. And the important thing is, here is that all um, those hooks are working in a synchronous manner. That means when you call this function uh, you'll, uh, and this function returns, that means that the, the transaction on the bus is done and, and and you don't have to wait for a callback to be called or, or things like that. Everything is synchronous. Yeah. IBIs, uh, so pretty much the same function you had in the a API, in the device driver API, except that here you have to implement them. So request API, IBI, fear IBI, enable IBI, disable IBI, so that's pretty obvious. There is one more, which is here to uh, recycle a slot that was used to store a payload of an, AB, an IBI. And yes, again, one of the important design choice we made was to uh, execute IBI handlers in uh, non-atomic context, so in a work queue context. And this, because the uh, other Transfers are done in synchronous manner. That means that from the IBI handler, you are able to send a new, something new on the bus. Still, if you can avoid it, you should avoid it because there is one more queue per controller. That means that if you send something on the bus, you block every other IBI handler. So maybe we'll have to rework that a bit to, to make it a bit scalable, a bit more scalable. Uh, and yeah, the IBI slots have been allocated ahead of time. That means that if the uh, IBI device driver is not queuing the IBI fast enough, it will lose uh, some of the IBIs. Join uh, again, not a lot of facility in the framework because I'm not sure how other controllers will handle that. So uh, it's basically an interrupt you, you will receive from the controller, and you will have to, uh, when you receive that, you will have to trigger a new DAA. So really nothing else we can expose here. So that's basically all we've done. Um, the status is that we have submitted two versions of the RFC. Um, everything that I des described in the slides uh, have been tested and implemented. Um, the only problem right now, or the, the problem we had before, was that we didn't have any real device. So we were using a dummy slave device, which we were more or less controlling. So that, then, that, that was a problem. And the next version should have a real device driver for a GPIO expander. So it should be able to use uh, all of the I API I've been exposing in uh, the device.h file. So that's it. Um, not much time for questions, but let's, let's go. Okay. Sorry. So the question is, what if we, all in, it, what if we have in, identical parts connected on the same bus, right? Yeah, so there is an instance ID error. If I find it. Oh. 
but there is an instance ID. So, so you can, by controlling some, some of the pins of the device, you can assign a specific instance ID, which will provide a different PID, which then means that you will be assigned a different address, dynamic address. So that, that works, that's supported. Yeah, so it will likely have to be configured a bit differently in hardware, whether it's with switches or by connecting pins to different levels. Um, so how mature is the hot plug support? Because that looks very handy for making smart peripherals. How much? Sorry. How, how mature is the hot plug, hot plug support? How mature is that? Like, um, is there other devices I can get out there, for example, an embedded? Um, I think the, um, the specification does not say anything about how to uh, plug devices physically on the bus. So that's not defined at all. Now for the um, soft, the, the, how to generate an interrupt to signal an odd join event, this is really, I think it's, it's mature enough. But how to actually plug a device and not disturb all the devices on the bus is not dealt with in, 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 in the spec, unfortunately. So about that, um, so, the MIPI group is defining the spec, right? It yeah. is totally free of licensing and stuff like that? Uh, should be. Okay, so then my question comes, who is assigning and defending VIDs and PIDs? Because like, that's part of the reason you pay into USB is so that those are defined yeah, and no I, one else clobbers over your actually vendor. Actually, I don't have the answer, but I guess this is MIPI will, who will assign uh, manufacturer okay. IDs at least. Okay. And then, so finally, on that about the hot plug question, yeah. so that's not defined what triggers that at all. So, like in the case of an I squared C, you have it's very common to have I squared C muxes, and so I'm wondering, like in a mux case, how do you say, okay, I've switched to the other branch of the mux, I need to go hot plug these new devices in? Again, it's not specified in the specification, so so it's up to the device manufacturer to decide how to uh, trigger the join event. Yeah. Uh, how this compares to USB? Because I'm thinking about you know two data lines. You have uh, oh, at plug. You have I device it's, recognition. It's much slower than USB for for sure, <laughs> and it's uh, also uh, it has better energy efficiency than, than than USB. It's really for small embedded devices, uh, and it's it's, it's about uh, energy saving. So it could, couldn't be replaced by uh, a USB. Uh, just a, sort of a follow-up on that. Are you expecting sort of a common device driver for peripherals to start coming out? Um, it seems like right now with this concept, drivers, you're going to need redundant drivers being implemented for all peripherals to maintain backwards compatibility. And some of that could be alleviated if there are common drivers, I mean, like CDC that you find. Yeah, it, yeah. Um, that Actually, until they define a command interface for a specific kind of device, it's not possible. So, so we need to wait for them to standardize things, and I can't tell if it will even happen. It's, it's not yet decided, I think. Um, so a, another hot plug question. What, one of the things that's caused a lot of hassle for um, some of the other MIPI buses with their um, hot plug support is what happens if you have a device you want to put into very low power mode by physically removing its power. Uh, it then rematerializes on the bus, renumerates, yeah. um, and the the bus core has then got to work out that actually this was a, this is a it's, device I already know, know about. Yeah, the so it, it's not probe. supported yet, or at least in, not in the V2 of the RFC, but I'm working on that. So I'm working on, on trying to figure out, oh, this is a new device, okay, I assigned a new address. But actually, I, I knew this device, so I shouldn't create a new one, a newest instance in Linux, and I should instead update the address instead of creating a new device. So, that's things I'm, I'm working on. Hopefully it should be supported correctly. Okay, thanks. Oh, one last question maybe. 
Yeah, so the question is when do I expect to see actual devices? Uh, I really don't know. <laughs> so, okay, thanks. Thanks a lot.